All right. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, uh, I wanted to get your reaction to, I guess, a Cannabis Control Board has been uh, soliciting for um, feedback on their proposed rules and regulations that they're uh, in the process of finalizing. And you had some issues with the, the use of uh, marijuana, particularly in the Tumon Tours district. Can you explain a little bit about that? Sure, of course. So I think, you know, I was the chairman of GVB for a few years there and I wrote the, or co-authored the Tourism 2020 plan. I think most people on Guam recognize that families are an important part of our, our business, but most probably don't recognize to the extent. 89% of Koreans are families and 53% of those families have children under 18. So, I mean, if you imagine yourself, I'm you know, put it to you this way. I can't imagine a Japanese father with his six-year-old daughter playing on the beach, breathing in uh, clouds of cannabis, saying two thumbs up, I'm coming back to Guam. So we just have to be really careful what we do. I'm not, just to be clear, I'm not opposed at all to what anybody does in the privacy of their own home, do your thing, or, or in public, but not in the middle of the tourist zone, not in the H zone. So we found out about the uh, rules and regulations being finalized. I found out uh, nine in the morning, um, called, finally got feedback about 12 noon that uh, testimony was going to be done at 5 p.m. that day. I just read a PDN article. I got on the phone, Nestor, at 12 noon and called around to the different organizations. And within three hours, we had letters from Guam Chamber of Commerce, Chinese Chamber of Commerce, Guam Tra Contractors Association, Japan Guam Travel Association, Korea Guam Travel Association, the Guam Visitors Bureau, all saying exactly the same thing. No use in Tumon, no sale in Tumon, don't promote this. Do it somewhere else, but you know, not everybody said do it somewhere else. Uh, Guam Chamber said, you know, perhaps a red light district. Um, and I, you know, I feel the same way, that's a possibility. But you know, to see that kind of response, so most of those organizations needed to call emergency board meetings to authorize the release of that letter. So you, it's just massively overwhelming uh, because they all understand the economic impact. We might gain five or 10,000 uh, tourists who want to come and, and smoke pot and have some fun. We're going to lose 100 to 200,000 out of 1.6 million, maybe half. I don't know. I don't want to fear monger, but it's certainly going to be a lot more than the number who might come. And uh, the other thing people don't really realize is it's not only illegal to use drugs in Korea, including cannabis, but if you use them overseas, you're arrested on return. And they do it to celebrities and high profile people to make an example. So what's it gonna look like for Guam when the first celebrity flies back into Korea and is arrested and that's front page news? I mean, we spent 50 years building ourselves up as a safe, family friendly, clean, wholesome destination. I, I just, we have to be really careful. You know, tourism is already really uh, fragile in suffering and we just can't afford right now to, to take that kind of bet. I don't think anytime we should take that bet. But like I say, I think you can, you can put it in a different zone. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that. That's sort of a separate, separate discussion point. You know, I was going to ask you, yeah. I, I was, uh, so the specific um, issue that you have with it is to prohibit it from uh, being used in uh, Tumon and, and any other hotel um, zone, is that correct? That's correct. That's okay. Correct. And not to promote it, right? Not to not to be broadcasting it um, as our core marketing strategy. You know, maybe you could do it in a niche way and in, in High Times magazine or something, but not our core mass media marketing. So it's it's prohibiting the use, sale, and promotion of cannabis in the H zone. That's sort of the, the simplest way to say it. All right. And what is your position or do you take a position on um, uh, medicinal marijuana? Because that's oh. one of the things that I had, I had heard before was that um, one of the maybe offshoot industries that uh, legalization of marijuana would create would be for um, uh, visitors from those countries that are, are you know, our, our, our core market countries that uh, aren't able to avail of, of medicinal marijuana in their home countries. And that they would come to Guam. Um, what's what's your position on, on on medicinal marijuana? I don't care. I don't mind either way. I'm ambivalent. It's not that I don't care. I'm ambivalent. I, I, there's some good things to think about with that, and there's some potential consequences to think. But I think generally, 
I really don't have a position on it, Nestor, as long as it's not in your face in the tourist zone. I mean, again, if you put it in a clinic somewhere else where the average, you know, five-year-old little Japanese tourists aren't wading through wafts of cannabis, it's fine. And I, and I recognize there's candy and there's other e-cigarettes and so forth, but just generally speaking, we have a wholesome image. We should maintain that. And you want to promote niches, medical marijuana in a clinic outside of two months, fine. No, no problem. Yeah. But just be careful what we do and how we do it, right? Yeah, and, and you're aware, of course, of other parts of the world, uh, European countries, Amsterdam comes to mind, where they do, in fact, have um, these cannabis um, coffee shops, if you will, and, and that's not something that you'd like to see uh, occur in Guam. No, I wouldn't say that either. I, I don't mind. I, I think, again, I'm just kind of focused on protecting and preserving our, our tourism base. So, you know, it's funny you mentioned Amsterdam. I've been there, right? And But you look at places like uh, even Las Vegas, which is Sin City, right? So in Las Vegas, strip clubs are not allowed in the hotel zone. They're only allowed in the industrial zone. That's Sin City. It's, it's close. It's two miles away, but it's a separate area. And I think the vast majority of jurisdictions, um, maybe Amsterdam's uh, excluded. I don't know if I don't know if Amsterdam is even wide open or if it's relegated to an area. I'm not sure. But most destinations, right? You just put it in a separate place. A good master planning says take, uh, you know, strip bars and adult merchandise, sex toys. And because you've got that in Tumon too, you've got Japanese signs. It's, it's not a wholesome image. You know, uh, Mr. Cruz from the G Cannabis Control Board made the comment uh, that it's hypocrisy. He's right in a sense, uh, but two wrongs don't make a right. What we really should do is get all of those activities and, and put them in a separate area and, and make it a great space. I mean, organize it, manage it well, make it clean and, and safe. Um, you know, Enigua comes to mind as one possible area for that, for example. Uh, you got the, the beach side, you've got, you know, it's, it'd be a nice revitalization. Um, or Harmon, you know, if the, uh, you know, in Manila, there are some buildings that have a whole bunch of uh, topless bars in them, right? So it's just a single building with 20 bars inside. So you could do that in Army. You could take a 50,000 square foot warehouse and make it hostess bars, massage parlors, strip clubs, uh, adult merchandise and cannabis cafes. And no, no worries, no harm, no fall. And whoever wants to go can go. You can have a little admissions tax that'll pay for the, pay for the facility and bid it, bid it out to the highest bidder. If you don't want to have 20 little lousy ones, just have one great big one. You know, that, that's an idea. Or like I say, Enigua is another idea. There, several places you could do this, just not down on the beaches and the streets of Tumon. That's all we're asking. Anywhere but Tumon. And, and when you called around to the various, um, uh, like the Korean Tourism Association, the Japanese uh, Tourism Association, JTA, um, they all share those, uh, those same sentiments? Yeah, more strongly than I even. And in fact, they're sort of not very happy that it's legal in the first place. And, and don't take my word for it. I'm, you know, I'm the, the gaijin in the room. I'm not a Japanese. But I think if you ask any Korean tourism industry person or any Japanese tourism industry person, I think you'll, you'll get the same reaction, right? It's, when you mentioned Amsterdam, there's a, a, something I forgot to say. There's a huge distinction and difference between European and American tourists sitting in a cafe in Amsterdam and Japanese and Korean families big difference. I mean, culturally a big difference. Even forget the family issue. I mean, they don't, they just don't, we, we can't point to Amsterdam and say we should be Amsterdam. If we had Amsterdam's tourism base, great. I mean, some people will say, yeah, but if you have it, then you'll attract that base. And like I said, yeah, you'll attract five to 10,000 and you'll lose 300,000. I mean, just, we have to be careful what we do. Yeah, and in addition to the private sector opposition, I understand also that the government agencies such as GVB and GHRA are also in opposition to any the use of marijuana in Tumon. Yeah, I think the hotel rooms is another issue, right? Because the, the initial draft of the rules from the Cannabis Control Board uh, suggested they defined public place, not smoking in public place. That's the first draft, so that's good. They defined all the different places, but they said public place shall not include private residences, no problem, or hotel rooms. So the, the problem there is the hotels make it illegal to smoke in the room. So you're gonna make it 
legal to smoke marijuana in the room, but against hotel policy. You know, and, and here's the other point. If you can't smoke in public, which is what the rules say right now, and you can't smoke in your hotel room, that the hotels don't allow it, forget what the law is, where are you, if you're a tourist, where are you gonna smoke it? So why would we sell product in Tumon if there's no place to legally consume it? You're just asking people to break the law. And again, I know the e-cigarettes and there's some other, you know, it's not all uh, pot, but I, I, again, it goes to image and reputation and, and, and how we're trying to position ourselves. The other thing I throw out is I was in Montreal last year with my family, you know, and again, I don't mind, I don't even mind people smoking wherever they want to smoke in Montreal it doesn't, you know, it, we don't have, they don't, they're not relying on Japanese tourists and Korean tourists, but as a, as a Caucasian who doesn't really, you know, I don't care what people do to, for themselves. I'm walking down the sidewalk. I can't, I'm, I'm walking through clouds of, of cannabis smoke. Every time I went out of the hotel, we went home, our clothes reeked of marijuana. I just, I'll never go. I love Montreal. I'll never go back. So. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Mark Baldiga, Baldiga Enterprise founder of um, the Sandcastle and the Beach Bar and, and several other uh, Tumon uh, and visitor industry businesses. Uh, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Esther. Cheers. All right. Take care.